So I want to welcome everyone to uh, the Service Employees International Union. We are delighted to be hosting this event of the American Constitution Society this afternoon. Um, and we have a distinguished um, panel here, and um, so I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, for those of you who are not, uh, who have never been here before or don't know the Service Employees International Union, we are a union of two million members. We are, uh, we represent public services workers, property services workers, and healthcare, wor healthcare workers throughout the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico. And uh, this panel topic is very fitting uh, because our union focuses on changing the narrative and changing the country around in issues of income inequality, economic justice, and racial justice. And so we're delighted to have a legal panel that will address those topics. Um, I also serve on the board of the American Constitution Society, so this is a great opportunity to bring together um, two organizations that I feel passionately about. Um, and I'm gonna turn over the panel to my colleague, Dora Chen, uh, who will be moderating and facilitating the discussion this afternoon. Dora is our uh, attorney who focuses on campaign finance law and all things concerning the union and our engagement with political campaigns and, um, and electoral politics, including voting rights and um, work protecting the right uh, of all citizens to vote. Um, so she's really busy right now, as you can imagine, um, because we have been deeply engaging with all of the presidential candidates around income inequality and labor law, and Dora's been leading that work. So we are honored to get to have even an hour and a half of Dora's time um, right now, and um, uh, because she's really the expert in that area. And, and I will say, too, that um, one of the things that we've been working on uh, at SEIU is thinking forward about labor law reform and structural changes that need to be made to our labor laws at the state, local, and federal level. And we've been working closely with um, the Clean Slate Project, which I don't know if any of our panelists will be talking about structural changes to labor law and the work that we're trying to um, move forward in 2020 and beyond. After little bracket, I know it's a 501c3 event, but after we win back our country, and I'm saying that as general counsel of SEIU, and not as a general as a board member of ACS, um, but um, that's also a project that we've been working on, and hopefully Dora will be able to talk about a little bit today as well. So, with no further ado, I will turn it over. Great, thank you, Nicole, for that introduction. And so, I'm thrilled to welcome everybody to um, the American Constitution Society's um, panel discussion today. Mind the gap: How law can address income inequality. Uh, this topic is more timely than ever before as income inequality is at its greatest uh, level since the Census Bureau has actually started measuring income inequality, so for the last 50 years. Um, a recent study found that the top 0.1% owns more wealth than the bottom 80% of our country, and that the United States actually resembles China and Russia in terms of wealth distribution. And we know that the federal minimum wage is only $7.25, um, and while the folks at the top uh, seem to get richer and continue to accumulate wealth. Uh, we know income inequality has also taken center stage in the American political debate. Um, the presidential candidates have been uh, talking about uh, income inequality more and more. Um, and we know that there are many avenues, legal avenues, that can address income inequality, including labor law, antitrust law, um, and tax law and various ways that we can address income inequality and also uh, the racial gap um, in income inequality. Um, so we're here today to talk about the various policy proposals in these areas and what also what constitutional pitfalls that we should be aware of. And we have a fantastic panel of experts to help us think through these issues. Um, so I think everybody has full bios at their seats so we don't want to take up too much time reading those. Um, but we'll just do brief introductions for each. Um, to my left uh, is Lisa Kyler Barrett. Uh, she's the Director of Policy at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, to her left is Ganesh Siddharaman, who is the Chancellor Fellow, Faculty Fellow and Professor of Law at Vanderbilt Law School. Um, to his left is Lena Khan, who is an Academic Fellow at Columbia Law School and Counsel on the U.S. House Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial and Administrative Law. And to her left, uh, Anne-Marie Anne Lofaso, the Arthur B. Hodges Professor of Law at West Virginia University College of Law. Um, we will be saving the last 20 minutes or so uh, for audience questions, so be sure to save those um, while you're paying close attention. 
So I want to start off um, by asking each of the panelists um, for their uh, big ideas on how uh, reform can address um, income inequality um, in their particular ex areas of expertise. Since we are at SCIU, I can take moderator's privilege and start with uh, um, our labor law expert, uh, Anne. Uh, we know that unions have been the key vehicles for um, uh, attacking uh, corporate power and acting as a counterbalance to um, increase corporate power and income inequality. But we also have ex been experiencing decades of right-wing attack on labor unions, uh, which has really taken its toll on union density. Um, some unions like SCAU, as Nicole has said, we have been stating publicly that we need to be rewriting the rules entirely on labor law reform. Um, and so we'd love for, to hear your thoughts on um, how you think uh, labor law could be reformed to address um, income inequality. Well, thank you. And I switched seats, by the way. So oh, gosh, because, sorry. Because that's OK. Because Turn on your mic. I wanted to have the, uh, the mic. OK. But anyway, more, more importantly, my thoughts. Oh, can you turn your mic? Mic. Oh, sorry. sorry. I should have. I should have said that. Um, yeah. Turn it on. Yeah. Just hi. Great. Okay. So, thank you so much for your question. Um, I think the number one thing we need to do to change um, labor law is eight before. If you look at labor when it's at its strongest is when it can do secondary activity. And I think a lot of eight before is unconstitutional right now. Uh, I think we need to, to we, that's incremental reform, is just cleaning that up in terms of the, but what we really need to do is make sure that, um, that unions and working class people in general um, can engage in secondary boycott without threat. That would give enormous economic and political strength to working class people. I also think uh, we need, we definitely need complete um, we need to rethink about things. I think one thing that unions in general should do, and before I say that, I do want to say that the SEIU has been at the at has been really the leader, in my view, of thinking forward and actually trying to think outside the box. One thing I'd like to see unions do, and I maybe they're doing more of this than I realize, but I think they have to think about ways that they that they can do things that are not necessarily strengthening unions, but just strengthening the working class. And what do I mean by that? Is that something like 8A2 um, is a, there's a lot of um, things that might be unlawful under 8A2 um, as the so-called company union that really would help workers start to work together that may not be interested in unions and understand how important it is to work together and have a working class consciousness. And then um, I think that would eventually um, help, it would be that sort of coming together that would bring some education to people that would eventually strengthen unions as the leaders of the working class. And I also think we have to think very strongly about things like they do in Europe um, with, um, um, uh, oh, it's, the name is escaping me right now, what Germany does all the time, works councils. Um, and finally, I think we do need to go back to something like the Bullock Report and look at um, ways of bringing more true uh, industrial democracy by having workers actually have a presence on um, boards of directors in big corporations. I just want to step back one little bit and say that um, I, I think that we also have to think about small businesses have a lot more in common with the working class than they do with big corporations. And big corporations, for example, McDonald's, and have, have sort of co-opted the small businesses. And I think we need to show small businesses that they're really more like us. And that, um, I, so I think right now the labor movement has been very, um, has sort of made that divide there in terms of anything that's a business is business. But small businesses really are much more about working class. And so we have to start to rethink about that. Um, I have some more specific ideas, but I think I'll, I'll stop there. 
Great, thanks, Anne Marie. And so next, I want to turn to Lisa um, and talk a little bit about uh, you know we we've we're we've been talking about structural <coughs> racism a lot here at SCIU, and it's been a um, uh, a timely topic this year, given it's the 400th anniversary of the first arrival of um, enslaved people in our country, and it's it's really embedded in our nation's history and economic systems. Um, and many of us in the labor movement view unions as a key vehicle for addressing both economic and racial inequality. Um, but I'd love to hear from you to speak a little bit more about policy reforms that uh, you think uh, would be the best ones to put on the table for addressing income inequality um, in communities of color. Great, thank you so much for the question. Again, my name is Lisa Kyler Beard. I'm the Director of Policy at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Um, we were founded in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall, and we have been separate, wholly separate from the NAACP, though we, we um, jokingly refer to them as our kissing cousin um, since <laughs> 1957. Um, and, you know, I feel fortunate to work there in that we ha use sort of a full toolbox of, of strategies to advance policies to eliminate disparities, much like what we're talking about here today. So uh, advocacy, litigation, which everyone is probably most aware of LDF for. Um, but we also have a strong policy uh, arm and a strong public education arm. And we really do look at um, income inequality through this structural frame. So if you think about um, how we got to this place of racial inequality today, we um, believe it is through a predictable consequence of years of government sanctioned policies and practices um, which purposefully discriminated against black people in this country. So if you think about um, land seizures, if you think about um, the ways that uh, federal programs were established to deny blacks the opportunities to have federal home loans but allowed others to have loans, um, if you think about the Social Security Act initially excluding farm workers and domestic workers that were predominantly African Americans, um, and even to more present day, the targeting of some subprime loans to black communities, then we feel pretty strongly that that history of having policies and practices um, that were really creating or exacerbating um, inequality, that the response needs to be the same, that there needs to be a structural policy-driven solution to um, this inequality. We also feel pretty strongly that the inequality results from an, a sort of interdisciplinary um, set of policies. So we don't just, we agree that um, labor and, and employment are certainly a huge part of that, but we also think housing and education and all of these other areas intersect with that. So if you think about within the housing space, um, I think the other thing that I'll just say is, is we do think that there are po current policies in place and current laws in place that have not fully real, been fully realized. Their potential has not been fully realized, and I would dare say um, in recent years they are actually under attack. So it's not just what are the new reforms, but also how do we gird down and really enforce the things that are in place. So within the housing context, um, actually enforcing the fair housing laws um, that are currently in place and, and the reinstatement and enforcement of the duty to affirmatively further fair housing, which really looks at um, how where people live impacts their opportunity. Do they have access to good jobs? Do they have access to transportation? Um, do they have access to good schools? Um, you know, looking at um, how we expand housing choice vouchers, um, issues around down payment assistance programs and how we ensure that um, we can increase um, African American home, home ownership, which is actually at the lowest that it's been since the Fair Housing Act was enacted. Um, within the employment space, um, you know, this issue around criminal record screening and, and uh, for employment and how we in, uh, address the unnecessary um, aspect of that. Increasing the federal minimum wage we think is really important. Um, strengthening protections, worker protections and collective bargaining mechanisms. And I'll just say my father was a strong union advocate, so I grew up in that household and in that tradition and, and fully understand um, the history uh, of what that has meant to communities of color. Um, <clears throat> and then, also ensuring equitable distribution of wealth 
building benefits such as retirement benefits and health benefits. And um, I think that goes back to um, some of the comments about, you know, sort of small businesses and where people are working. Um, within the education space, um, looking at how we advance uh, racial and economic desegregation of schools, um, investing in historically black colleges and universities, which we know um, are educating a majority of, of people of color in this country, supporting affirmative action and admin in admissions and financial aid. I'm happy to say we had a positive result on the Harvard case recently in that regard. Um, within retirement, establishing retirement programs um, that are not um, just tied to a place of employment based mm -hmm. on how we know that people are moving from place to place in employment and not necessarily working in the same place for 40 years the way that my father did. Um, but um, those are just some of some of the areas. I think, again, um, this issue of that it's a both and. So it is um, how do we ensure that the protections that are in place now that that um, really have a good outlook are actually reach their full potential and are actually uh, defended and still in place. Um, but then also, how do we think about some, some new reforms that mm -hmm. we need to put in place? Great. Thank you, Lisa. And then now turning to uh, Ganesh, uh, you're, you actually wrote a book, um, The Middle Class Constitution, arguing that the U.S. Constitution is premised on having a thriving middle class without extremes and rich and poor. So we'd love to hear more about that and particularly the implications you think um, our current um, income inequality has uh, on our democracy. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here uh, at an ACS event. I've been a longtime member of ACS and, and on the board, and so it's exciting to see so many people turn out for, for an event on this. Um, I, I thought what I'd do is first just say something um, a little bit more broad about what we're talking about, which I think is broader than income inequality uh, and actually goes to what I would call just economic inequality, which has different components. One is income. Uh, how much money you're, you're taking in every year. And for a lot of people, we think of that in terms of wage earners and wage income. Um, but there's also wealth inequality, the overall wealth that someone has. Um, and that accumulates, includes a variety of uh, you know, housing and capital and uh, other things as well. Um, and then on top of that, there's, I think, an even broader category of economic inequality that gets to who holds economic power in our society. And so when you think about corporations and you want to think about the imbalance of power in our society, both economic power and political power, uh, there's an element of inequality there, too. When you have, uh, and I think Lena will talk a little bit more about this, um, extremely large corporations that have a lot of power power, both economically and, political, uh, and politically, that is a type of inequality uh, that exists in our society. Um, and the challenge, I think, to our constitutional system uh, is one that people have understood for a very, very long time, um, going back even to the founders and really going back to the ancients, which is that in any society where you have a deep uh, divide between the rich and the poor, where you have a lot of rich, a lot of poor, um, you have a very <coughs> unstable system. Either the rich are going to oppress the poor or the poor are going to try to overthrow the rich. And the result will be violence, instability, and revolutions. Um, and this is a common thing that you can find in the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and pretty much in any political or constitutional theorist writing about the structure of government from the ancient world all the way through up till the founders. And the founders talk about this problem as well. Uh, and the solutions um, historically have really been twofold. One. Uh, build economic inequality right into the structure of government. So in England, you have a house of lords for wealthy people. You have a house of commons for commoners for everybody else. And the idea is that these two classes, lords and commons, will check each other, and that will create some stability. Um, the other theory is that you don't do that, and you just assume that you're going to have a big middle class and that you're not going to have these deep inequality divides. Um, so there's been a, 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 these were the kind of two solutions historically that people have thought through. And I think part of our challenge today as we think about our constitutional system uh, is that we don't have checks in our system that address problems of inequality. Our constitution says almost nothing about economic equality or inequality, about the rich, about the poor, about corporations. Um, it leaves a lot of things open. And so part of the challenge we have is as a society in you know, non-structural -constitu non constitutional terms, um, we have to make policy. 
And I think that's really what, where the law comes in is because none of the equalities or inequalities we're, we're thinking about are independent of policy choices. There's no natural uh, state in which we can say um, there's just inequality of these policy types in the economic realm. They're all a function of policy choices, whether that's in labor law or housing or education or trade or antitrust. Um, and so I think the question is, how do we want to, to address that? And, and I'll, I'll make a brief um, pitch for, for two ways that we can think about this. One is in structural terms, which is how do we design rules and systems so that markets work in ways that actually are uh, more distributively egalitarian and that give people a lot of opportunity um, so that's one approach, a structural approach. And then a second approach is that there's concentration uh, of wealth and power, and we uh, accept some element of that and redistribute it after the fact. Um, there may be a place to have both of these elements at different places, but I think one of the things in the policy conversation that over you know, many years has gotten um, shorter shrift and recent years is getting more attention is moving towards these structural kinds of reforms, um, what some scholars have called pre-distribution, rather than just thinking about tax and transfer as a form of redistribution. Um, and those structural reforms actually build a system that works to create more uh, equality, works to create a larger middle class. And I think that's a place where, you know, in the questions we can probe mm -hmm. more into some of that. Great, thank you. And that's a great segue to, uh, to Lena. Um, in terms of questions around checks on economic inequality and what structures we have in place. Um, you know, antitrust law has become a hot topic now, um, rediscovered among uh, progressives. Um, we know that antitrust law first came in the United States in the last you know, big era of corporate concentration and then the progressive era, which led us to um, antitrust laws we have today. Um, and now we're living in another time of that. Um, now, is that just a coincidence that we're seeing um, high levels of corporate concentration and economic inequality, or, or what, do you, what are your views on how antitrust law can play a role? Great, thanks, and thanks to ACS for inviting me. Um, as a current government employee, I need to make the requisite disclaimer that I'm speaking in my own personal capacity, um, and not, nothing I say reflects the views of the antitrust subcommittee. Um, just to step back a minute, I think it's worth underscoring the degree to which we are seeing profound concentration of economic power across our markets. So this is true not just of major markets like telecom and airlines, but also of just many, many obscure markets that people don't usually think about, like waste management, pet food, mattress manufacturing. I mean, the list really goes on and on. And I think it really underscores the way in which extreme concentration is now a systemic feature of our economy rather than just an isolated feature of this market or that market. Um, the second thing is, you know, this, there are many factors that have contributed to creating extreme concentration of economic power, but a key, one key factor is the dramatic retrenchment of antitrust laws. So antitrust laws, you know, uh, at the federal level were passed um, in the late 1800s. Uh, the goal of these laws was fundamentally political. Uh, the goal was about ensuring um, that there are checks on corporate power, uh, that monopolists are not able to abuse their power, and that monopolies are disfavored and really not able to emerge in the first place um, to the degree that you know you have competitive markets that don't require uh, economies of, of, of scale. Um, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a dramatic intellectual revolution uh, where uh, the Reagan administration basically codified a new way of doing antitrust that discarded all of the original goals and basically made it a very technical enterprise that was geared around basically assessing efficiencies. Um, and so whenever you had you know, a certain big merger, the main consideration would be how is this going to affect efficiencies? Um, is this going to raise prices for consumers? Um, and really shifted the analysis from a robust analysis of the market structure to basically looking at certain welfare outcomes um, that neglected to consider, I think, a good part of uh, the reality of how businesses actually exercise market power. Um, and I think the structure of our economy today in good part reflects that policy choice to basically sharply retrench antitrust. Um, I think in terms of you know, the way in which concentrated corporate power is contributing to economic inequality, um, there are a whole set of ways in which uh, companies with market power and monopolies can exercise that power. Um, you know, the obvious way is for hiking prices for consumers. Uh, there's been great empirical evidence over the last few years showing that markups are 300% higher today than they were in the 1980s, which is pretty much you know, a 
direct wealth transfer um, to the degree that, you know, 80% of the value of the stock market is owned by around the wealthiest 10% of Americans. Um, you know, the, the uh, shareholder value that is being produced is basically also contributing to an upwards wealth transfer. Um, there's also been research showing that labor markets are, the average labor market in America is highly concentrated, um, which means that workers have less power. Uh, we're seeing that manifest in a whole set of ways. So um, employers, you know, increasingly are imposing uh, non-compete agreements on workers. They're engaging in no poach agreements with employers, which basically restricts the ability of um, a worker to switch jobs and gives them less bargaining power. Um, there's also good research showing that increasing concentration in labor markets correlates with uh, decreasing wages. So again, a very clear pocketbook effect. Um, I think there's also good reason to think that, you know, the way in which monopolists stifle out the entry of new business also has distributive effects. So um, we're living in a 30-year low of new business formation. So there's been a dramatic decline in the ability of startups to enter markets. Um, to the degree that creating your own business was a traditional mechanism of building wealth and assets and transferring that to future generations, I think there's reason, good reason to be worried that that's no longer an avenue for uh, the creation of and preservation of a middle class. And so I think these are all mechanisms through which companies with a lot of power are using that power to enrich themselves at the expense of everybody else. Um, the good news is, is as Dora mentioned, you know, antitrust is again in the headlines. And I think there's a lot of energy around thinking through how do we you know, restructure antitrust to uh, reorient it around the original goals of lawmakers? Um, I, I would say that I think antitrust is one tool in a broader anti-monopoly toolbox. So antitrust mm. is a law enforcement regime, but there are all sorts of policy levers that are embedded across federal, state, and local governments that are basically geared around structuring markets. So, you know, uh, uh, Department of Transportation, the Treasury Department, the USDA, these are all federal agencies that are fundamentally engaged in structuring markets. And so to the degree that, you know, they can structure markets to promote uh, democratic and egalitarian ends as opposed to favoring the concentration of private power, I think that's kind of another muscle that we need to be recovering. Great. Thank you, Lena. And I think one of the themes that we've been hearing, and, and, and Lisa, you kind of uh, alluded to this, is, and Ganesh as well, um, we're seeing uh, questions around, do we, are we looking at a time now when our, we are seeing these changes in our economy um, with the rise in cor concentrated corporate power, with these big tech companies that are involved in all sorts of different aspects of our lives, whether we're looking at um, big structural changes that are, you know, as, as we said, new laws that we need or new legal regimes or uh, new ways that different government agencies should be approaching these legal questions. Um, or is it really, is it a question of just actual enforcement of existing laws? Um, and, and Lisa, you touched on that in terms of some of the civil rights era laws that are, um, have been languishing and not been enforced, um, particularly in the last uh, several years. And so I was wondering if you could, each of you could speak a little bit about um, the question of struct big structural reform, um, whether we need new laws, new regimes in your particular areas, or are there particular um, areas in which we're just talking about, we just need to you know, go back to or um, have more rigorous uh, law enforcement of existing laws? So you know, who wants to go first? So I'm going to choose an area <laughs> um, and, and talk about um, technology because we've been thinking about this a lot and and how technology is really impacting um, um, particularly people of color across a number of different areas. But I would say you know this is uh, true across the board um, and the need to really. Um, it, I'm going to say it's a both and again, mm -hmm. right? Like to the need to really. Um, help the companies themselves and the general public and lawmakers <laughs> understand that the existing civil rights protections actually apply within that context and help them um, see that framework within um, that space. But then to also think about what are the guardrails and, and policies that need to be in place to ensure that 
as this technology develops, and we certainly recognize, um, you know, there's a group of organizations that are actually in conversation about this now, but that we are behind, right? And I actually think to a certain degree we'll always be behind in terms of the rapid nature with which um, technology companies develop new um, algorithm, software, what have you, but that there needs to be some entity that is really put in place that is that is watching that, that is um, guarding against sort of these big monoliths developing, that is um, ensuring that um, the technologies are used in a way that that is for good and that doesn't, in the case of racism, doesn't further embed or, or exacerbate the racism that is the history of this country. Within the employment context, we've really been looking at how um, technology and algorithms sort of go across the span of um, an employment framework. So from used in every regard from um, how ads get targeted to, to folks and you know there were a number of our um, sister organizations that were involved in a lawsuit with Facebook around um, the targeting of ads within the housing context, but certainly within the employment context, that's true also. Um, to you know how uh, app, you know people get screened to actually be applicants, to what happens when they actually come become an employee, to even post employment, um, so that technology is it, this technology and use of algorithms is really impacting. Um, uh, the workforce across the span, and we really need to think about, um, again, how the existing civil rights protections um, apply there, but then what things do we need to put in place um, looking forward to ensure that as these technologies sort of iterate and, and become more complicated, that there is some way for us to monitor and ensure that they are for good and not for bad. So I'll pick up on two different areas, one economic, one a little bit more political. Um, so in an economic context, uh, so it can, if the question is, you know, do we have enough laws on the books and can we just enforce them? Um, obviously, I think we can enforce laws better and there's benefits to doing so. But a place where you can see why that's insufficient is if you just take into account our tax code. So we have we could have more IRS tax uh, enforcement um, to make sure people are paying their taxes. Um, that would be great. Um, I think that would be a, a, a useful thing to do. Um, at the same time, what we have seen is over the last 40 years, our tax laws have been re written in ways that actually reduce what the amount that the wealthiest people in the country have to pay is in taxes. Um, that's on the income side. It's when we talk about the estate tax as well. Um, and so the collective element of that is even if we have some greater enforcement, um, we have problems with the design of the underlying laws. And that's going to require legal change, not just increased enforcement, if we actually want to deal with how we think about our tax policy as something that could address the problems of inequality. Uh, a second area where I think um, you know we need to think about structural reform, where I think you see the the need for that compared to just regular enforcement, um, is the power that the economically powerful, whether that's individuals or companies, have over shaping decisions in government and politics. Um, and whether you want to start at the beginning of the process and think about campaign contributions and influence in the elections process or move to the legislative process and think about lobbying uh, and how much entities, um, especially trade associations and big corporations, spend on lobbying Congress in order to get uh, outcomes that they want. Or if you want to move to the executive branch and think about the revolving door of people who are lobbyists who work uh, in a company and then move directly to the regulator that's supposed to be regulating their industry, and then after their time in government, move right back to the industry that they were just regulating, um, that that can be a problem. Uh, if you think about the influence that companies have over the regulatory process itself in terms of trying to shape the regulatory outcomes prior to uh, regulations being proposed uh, or in the in the proposal process or afterwards when they go to the White House for review by the by the office that looks at regulations in the White House. Um, or if you want to go to our third branch, to the, to the courts, you can look at uh, how we have now the most pro-business uh, court that we've had uh, in, in many years, certainly, um, according to studies, uh, and the most pro-business justices on the court that we've had uh, in many, many years as well. Um, so across our spectrum on the political and government side, we also have this imbalance. And you know, existing enforcement of campaign finance laws and ethics laws and lobbying restrictions uh, certainly can be helpful. 
Um, but really, we have a systemic structural problem, which is that the laws are not designed to address the kind of influence that we're seeing in the ways that we're seeing it. And what we need to do is think about proposals that will actually reshape that to a much greater degree um, on the campaign finance side, on the lobbying side, uh, and on the executive branch side, uh, and the judicial side as well. So those are places where I think you know, um, what we need to do is move towards these structural changes uh, because existing enforcement isn't going to get us to where we need to be. Can I just jump in on that? So I, I agree with that, but I would say, um, and I don't think that we're disagreeing, I'm just saying, I, I don't think it is to the exclusion of the existing uh, laws. Absolutely. And things that, yeah, yeah. So yeah. certainly I'm not advocating that we <laughs> bear down on law, existing laws and policies that are not <laughs> achieving what we want to achieve. But I do think that there are, there was, that for many of the laws and particularly the civil rights laws that are in place, there was a lot of thought put into um, how they are designed and we've never fully sort of realized that. And so that's the point that I'm making. Mm -hmm. I, too, have um, a sort of economic idea and a more political um, thought. Um, w clearly, we have to have enforcement of laws. I agree with that. But um, we're not going to go anywhere without some structural change. And I think one of the areas we need to look at is, the, is technology. So I agree with what you were saying, Lisa. Um, we are entering into, or we are already in an, in, uh, in an age of AI. Um, we have seen throughout history that there's always been technological displacement of workers. And uh, eventually, um, the market sort of catches up. And then workers are, who are displaced um, find different jobs. But, the, but workers cannot catch up as quickly. Things are accelerating a great deal. So we need to kind of figure out what we're going to do about this, the, the artificial intelligence, this technological uh, displacement of workers in this area, and, and what jobs we are going to have, and what this is going to look like. And we need to do that now, and think about how this society is going to look like in 20, 30 years, or even less. So that's something that is a project I'm working on right now, um, and that I'm sure many people are working on. Um, but Nothing's going to happen if our government is allowed to, is free to lie to us. And what I think, and this goes back to the political, um, our government is the most coercive source of power. It's, it's hands down. It can take away our life, property, and um, our life, liberty, our property with due process. And that's minimal due process. The second most coercive power is business big business. But we have to remember government is the most coercive power. Um, that doesn't mean we don't want governmental solutions. I think there's a big difference between government protecting us and our elected officials. When our elected officials are allowed to lie to us and create an alternative universe so that people do not know what the truth is, or some of us know what the truth is and others don't, because they have a completely different universe, then we can't even create change. We can't because we can't agree on anything. So I actually think the first order of business when we get our government back is actually to put major, um, is to make major structural changes um, limiting the power of elected officials, including and most importantly the president. I think by doing that, and our government officials should certainly should not be free to be reckless, to free to lie to us or be reckless with the truth. Again, we don't really have much of anything if we don't have that political. And if you look at sort of the historical development of rights, it starts with political rights, civil rights, socioeconomic rights. I'm a person who's very interested in socioeconomic rights. But we don't have socioeconomic rights without political rights. And that's what we're losing right now. So we need to shore that up. Lena? Question on, um, is, it, uh, is it a question of big structural reform, or is it a question of just law enforcement and better enforcement of our existing laws? 
So I think antitrust is an area where we need both. Um, there's an enormous amount that you could do under existing authority. Uh, the antitrust laws themselves are, you know, written in pretty general uh, sweeping language and are subject to, you know, many different interpretations. Um, and what is so remarkable about the sea change that we went through in the 70s and 80s is that there was no change in the underlying statutes. Um, it was a revolution that was entirely executed through the courts and through the executive, uh, primarily through changing the legal framework um, that is applied when trying to assess whether a company is engaging in anti-competitive conduct. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of um, there's a lot that the antitrust agencies could do under current laws. Um, I think a model uh, law enforcer in this regard is, is Rohit Chopra, who's one of the Democratic commissioners at the FTC. Um, and over the last year, as the FTC has been, you know, uh, entering various settlements, he's been issuing a series of statements and dissents that are pointing out all the different authorities that the FTC could be using uh, in order to secure greater relief that would actually be, you know, addressing underlying problems and creating incentives for businesses to comply with the law, as opposed to, um, you know, just basically finding that don't change the underlying incentives. Um, similarly, I think at uh, federal agencies across the board, there's more that they could be doing under existing authorities to ensure that they're focused on competition issues and market power issues. Um, that said, there are certainly areas of antitrust law where the courts have introduced case law <laughs> that is um, basically preclusive to bringing and winning cases. Um, there's kind of a you know two ways in which uh, the courts have gutted antitrust law. One is through changing um, the normative purpose of antitrust and introducing efficiency as a goal. But the other, and I think in some ways more insidious way, is through embedding in case law uh, descriptions of how markets work that are just totally at odds with reality. And so I think those kinds of, um, that kind of case law does actually make it genuinely difficult to bring certain area, certain types of cases um, and probably will require intervention. Um, but I do think that there is a whole set of unused authorities um, that the antitrust agencies could be relying on more aggressively right now. Thank you. And another uh, common theme is a good segue. Another common theme that's come up is the role of government and the role of both government and also our tax system in income inequality. Um, you know, we've been living through a time when conservatives have successfully demonized government, um, often with racist stereotypes as to who is benefiting from government programs. The result is a weak regulatory state, a low tax environment where our public services and our schools and our infrastructures are um, underfunded. And now we've, we've just had a recent uh, tax reform by President Trump where taxes are even lower now on the wealthy. And so I'm wondering if each of you could speak to you, what you think is the role of uh, government and tax policy um, on addressing income inequality, particularly as Anne, you mentioned too, we're n we've also now lived through a time where um, the president and, and government has seized on the um, its authority and used it in a way that um, that has been quite negative. And so th just how that would affect how progressives view um, government um, uh, and the role in income inequality. Well, either. Uh, um, I just, since I sort of started the, the <laughs> negative part of government, I want to, I want to rehabilitate government also. Um, I, I am a big believer in government. Government has its role, but I think we have to start by recognizing that our constitution created a limited government, limited in terms of its powers so that the people are not co coerced by this government that could take away our life, liberty, and our, our property. It's, it's, government is there to create a more perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, all of those things in the preamble. That's what government should be doing. And so government has a very strong role, well, uh, role in the welfare of our society. So when I, I, the way I see it is when, uh, I don't want to say conservatives, I want to say extreme conservatives, because I think it's unfair to conservatives, but say Trumpian Republicans, how they've demonized the role of government. I think what, they, what they're really doing, watch what they say, it's really what they're doing. It's a mirror, and you hold it up to them. So when they say this is happening, it's because they're doing those things, not what progressives are doing, not what moderates are doing, not even what conservatives are doing. Um, so I would say that 
we, we um, the role of government, and I think uh, Ganesh can speak much more to tax reform. Obviously, I think that we need to have um, tax reform and to to and, and distribution of wealth, but government um, works when it is involved in things that we were supposedly promised and didn't get: infrastructure, universal health care, um, and things to to help um, rise. The, uh, the working class, or at least make, create more equality. And the last thing I'll say on this is that we have to remember that our government, there is, uh, our constitution is built on two important values. Liberty is one, but the one that we always forget because it wasn't in the original constitution, but it very much is in our living constitution right now, is are the Civil War amendments, which is equality. And that's something that we have to fight back every single time when someone says our constitution is about liberty, it's about liberty and equality, and sometimes those goal, those values conflict. And when they conflict, we need to decide. And hopefully they don't, but they do sometimes. So I'll just jump in. Our president, director, council, um, Cheryl and I fall talks about this a lot in terms of how um, the narrative around um, public uh, programs and benefits has been, uh, you say demonized, she, she would say racialized, so that now when you hear public, you think person of color, you know, and, and negative sort of stereotypes with that. Um, and that we really need to, to do some work to take that narrative back. When we think about how the middle class in this country was created, it was through largely through public programs. And so um, we need to really do the work to understand um, that that public doesn't equate with bad, um, and that, in fact, it is an important part of the success of um, having a society in which you know people can thrive and do well and live live comfortably. So we need to reinvest in public education, in the safety net, in public transportation, and not have that be sort of a negative um, or a, with a stereotype um, associated with that. Um, and I think that also goes to this issue um, that we had amongst ourselves, I think, on a, a call around this issue of how we address um, racial inequality without it becoming a divisive issue um, so that, uh, you know, uh, whites that are at lower income are not feeling like they are being left out or that the focus on race is somehow leaving them out. And, and this issue around public good and public benefit, I think, is one of the ways that we start to get at some of that, that there is this larger benefit to having those types of resources. And we need to really reclaim the narrative mm -hmm. around that. I think the way that um, myth making has played out in kind of the economic sphere is to actually, you know, render, try and render government invisible, right? So there's this, the signature libertarian move is to suggest that markets and the economy exist totally separate from any government intervention, any, and, and any enforcement or regulation is somehow this, you know, uh, ex post uh, regulation or heavy-handed intervention, which you know we know is not true. Uh, government is intimately involved in setting up the underlying legal regimes that lead to property rights, that lead to contracts. Um, you know, business cannot exist without a foundation of law and government. And so, I think um, to the degree that uh, rehabilitating antitrust will also require doing some work on showing that actually the economy and our politics are intimately intertwined. Um, I think that's where we're going to see some of the same work. And I think I would add to that that the other place where government comes in is in providing basic social and economic goods to our people, and it has done so for an extremely long time in ways that it turns out we all like, even though people don't often talk about them. So um, if any of you have been to a public library or taken your children to a public library, um, those are public. It has public right in the title. Um, we have public swimming pools, we have public parks and public golf courses and public basketball courts. 
Um, there are public things everywhere in our society, and they've been around for a really long time. Uh, the post office is in the Constitution. We've had public swimming pools and libraries since the 19th century. Um, these are things that are public provisions, and people like them. People like Social Security. They like Medicare. Uh, and part of the reason um, that I think these direct government provision of goods and services uh, can be helpful is because they offer an opportunity for everyone. Uh, and they're, they tend to be universally accessible. Um, they tend to be affordable. Uh, and they're the kind of thing that everyone can access. And they create a foundation for both freedom and opportunity for, for a lot of people. I think one of the challenges that's happened in the last 40 years or so in the push against government has been a shift to say, instead of having these direct public provision of goods and services, we should uh, subsidize the market. And so we should use vouchers, we should use tax credits, um, other forms of subsidy, coupons, uh, to purchase goods in the marketplace instead. Um, this has had a number of consequences. One is it decenters uh, what government is actually doing. A subsidy is still a government action. It just doesn't seem as obvious. You don't know that it's government doing it. Um, and so th there's a challenge there. And what you partly need if you think about um, what it means to be in a democracy is we should be deliberating on our future together. And so part of things being public is it makes it easier for us to see what those benefits are, what the costs are, and you know, how we want to shape uh, those programs. Um, the other thing, though, is that in many cases, uh, the system of subsidies just doesn't work. Uh, it can actually lead to higher prices, um, and it doesn't provide the kind of basic level of social um, and economic access and equality that we want. And we've seen that uh, because after decades of having an approach that's been very hostile to direct provision of uh, goods and services, um, we are now in the era where we have the greatest inequality that we've had in a century. Um, so just on the basics, um, you know, we're not really seeing this kind of model work out very well. And I think that pushes also towards us trying to recover uh, a sense that you know, in a democracy, we can do these things together and provide for everyone in our society. And that should be a goal that we have. If I can just add a couple of things to that. Um, another thing that we all like is water. And it's the government that provides the water, right? Um, and we know what happens when our water is, is, is poisoned. We've seen it in West Virginia. We've seen it in Flint, Michigan. And we, so government's important for that. The other thing I think we can say to our libertarian brethren is that um, libertarian philosophy doesn't work without regulation. And I think this was said, but I want to make it express, that it, it depends on well-regulated laws on property. So when, I think we need to recapture that narrative is saying, no, it's not that you don't like regulation, you just want regulation of what you want. It's sort of like the way we've recaptured the narrative on, that, on who spends more money. We know that actually conservatives spend more money than liberals. We spend them on different things, though. We, spend, we want to spend our, our money on, um, on more on welfare programs, and conservatives tend to want to spend all of the money on military. What we've got to do is recapture that narrative and say, OK, we're really deliberating on what we're going to spend our money on. We're deliberating on what we're going to regulate, not whether there's going to be regulation. Thank you. And so I think what we I want to do it for our next question is we've talked a lot and we've been hearing a lot of ideas that um, in terms of big structural reform that we could have if um, we have a change in um, our government in two years. Uh, but one thing that most reformers have to grapple with is our increasingly conservative uh, judiciary. Um, and what is really possible um, that we can achieve through new government policies when we're confronted with um, conservative circuit courts, the Supreme Court as we now know it. Uh, we know from our historical experience that there can be a collision between um, popular uh, reforms and the Supreme Court back in uh, the New Deal era. Um, and so I'm wondering if each of you could speak to how you think the judiciary will interact with your area of um, expertise in terms of labor, antitrust, um, civil rights, um, both in terms of the impact of the conservative judiciary and your views, if you're willing to share them, on some of the court reform ideas that are um, being talked about in terms of uh, the, su the Supreme Court. So I think, you know, thank you for the question. I think the courts, uh, we do a lot of work around uh, judicial nominations and, and, 
you might expect that we're a legal organization. But, um, but we also think it's critically important that folks really realize what is happening with the courts. It's not the sexy thing, right? It's not Mark Zuckerberg going to um, testify before House Financial Services or, or what have you, but it is something that impacts, has the potential to impact um, the lives of everyone in this country. And, and we don't always see the attention to it in, in the way that recognizes or acknowledges that. And I see a couple folks that work on the courts um, in co we work on the courts in coalition. But um, and so if you think about what's happened in the last two, two and a half years, um, we now have 156 nominees that have been confirmed. Um, that's roughly a third of the federal court that has been confirmed. And regardless of what you think about um, political ideology, we're talking about nominees that have like extreme, extreme views and, and ideologies. So it's not just a difference of I'm nominated by a Republican uh, administration or a Democratic administration, but just really extreme ideologues. And so just to give you an example, um, Stephen Menashe is a, is a nominee that's currently sort of working his way through the system. Um, we certainly hope to stop that, but um, he has a sort of extreme views and writing. So, you know, the, the views are out there in writing. He hasn't disavowed them um, about just about every protected class you can think about. So African Americans, um, you know, and other people of color, um, LGBTQ community, um, women, um, just really offensive writing. So just to give you an example, um, <clears throat> While he was in college, he compared the collection of race data in college admissions to Nuremberg laws of Nazi Germany. Um, he also uh, defended a fraternity that threw a ghetto party, um, claiming that the perpetuation of derogatory and racist stereotypes were harmless and unimportant. Um, and I could go on and on. He, he perpetuated a myth around um, you know, bullets being dipped in pig fat as a way to uh, combat um, Muslim terrorism. Um, and so it, if you think about the fact that folks like this, and this is not an exception to the rule. I mean, he's one of the worst of the worst, but he is not an exception to what we've seen in terms of who's being nominated to the court. So if you think about a judiciary that then becomes filled with ideologues that have these really extreme views, you now have a system where folks can no longer feel like they're going to get a fair and impartial um, hearing when they go into a court. And that is what we're faced with now with one third of the federal court. And so what I would say, um, not getting into a structural reform, but just in, in terms of the, you know, going back to where I started, that courts don't tend to be the sexy thing, but we really have to um, do something to make sure that this issue is seen as um, a priority and an important issue as we move forward um, because these are the folks and the folks that are getting nominated are 40s, early 40s, <laughs> late 40s, 50s. So they're going to be on the courts for decades and impacting the lives of not just us but our children and possibly our grandchildren. And so this issue of, of who's sitting on the court has to be a real priority for folks as we move forward. Uh, okay. Sure. So um, the courts have definitely been very hostile to, um, you know, plaintiff side antitrust claims um, and have been a key vehicle through which antitrust has been enfeebled. Um, in terms of, you know, paths forward, there's obviously a broader question about how to deal with um, an increasingly conservative judiciary. But in antitrust specifically, you know, I do think that there are ways in which um, we could make antitrust more administrative. Um, right now, antitrust is basically treated like common law, which is uh, pretty anomalous for an area that's basically, you know, dealing with uh, regulating economic power effectively. And so thinking about, you know, competition rulemaking at the FTC um, and other kind of administrative tools to basically do antitrust without being as uh, reliant on the courts, I think is going to be um, in important path forward. Um, I will also say that, you know, one thing that's interesting about antitrust is that it's not, um, like many other areas, a, a situation where you only have a concentrated pit 
private interest pitted against a diffuse public interest, we're actually at a point where there are a lot of business interests that also want more vigorous antitrust enforcement. Um, and to the degree that that could potentially um, complicate you know, how the courts move in this area, I think that'll be interesting to see as well. I, I can't comment on specific um, judicial nominees because I'm, I really don't know that, I don't do the kind of work you do. I do have a lot of hope for the judiciary in terms of doing, eventually doing the right thing. And so I, I'm still very hopeful. And I, I hope that if we have people like you were referring to, Lisa, that get on the bench and then Im implement those views that we would use the impeachment process on those, on those people. But I, my prediction in terms of the judiciary, I'll, I'll focus on this one thing, is that I think Chevron is gonna be gone. And I, I've thought about this quite a bit, whether that will be a good thing or a bad thing, because I, as a former, I, I, I'm a tenure veteran of the NLRB, where I did appellate and Supreme Court work for them, and I was a big fan of Chevron, obviously, because I worked for the government, I liked Chevron. I'm looking at what the NLRB is doing now, and as I explained to my students, there's always sort of, in any kind of, even in, with a textual interpretation of things, there's always, the t words have a, have a rubber, have elasticity. And they kind of go here. Right now, the current board, in a way that I've never seen before, in all of my years there, and also in my, my studying of it from the beginning, from the very beginning, they've broken the rubber band, those words. So for me, and I'm not sure that we, under a Chevron analysis, while I think under a Chevron analysis they, it should, the courts shouldn't defer, I'm not sure they, they won't. So part of me thinks it, that while Chevron might go, that may not be a bad thing when you have extreme government in place, which is what we're seeing now. And it's only going to get more extreme unless we put an end to it because there will be a whiplash and then there'll be another whiplash effect. So I think the way, I'm a pragmatist, the way I see it is that I take what I have as a litigator. We right now have a textualist judiciary. Okay, National Labor Relations Act is a liberal statute. Go with textualism. Every single time they wanna bring in an outside value, say that's not what the text of the words say. That's not what the text says. Every time you do that, hold them to a textual analysis and criticize them when they don't do that. So that's what, that's what I would be doing. Chevron allows for a little bit more outside the text, doesn't it? Allows for, because you give deference. So that's where my mind has been going more, is specifically more with the National Labor Relations Board on this issue. So um, I, I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about structural reforms of the court, the other component here. Um, and there have been a variety of proposals that have been talked about, uh, including some that, that I've proposed. Um, so I thought maybe I'll just walk through what a few of those are and, and why you might be concerned about the, the court and want structural reform of the court itself. So I think we've, both, we've all uh, experienced the two uh, toxic confirmation battles of the last few years um, for different reasons, of course, uh, toxic. Um, but uh, one of the consequences, I think, of both of these confirmation battles uh, is that there are a large number of people in the country now who see the Supreme Court uh, as largely illegitimate. Um, because of stolen seats, because of a, a, fail, a, a flawed process uh, in confirmation. Um, and when you now have, for the first time really in modern history, uh, a 5-4 majority on the court that isn't just ideologically uh, aligned, but where that ideology aligns with the political, um, the, the partisan uh, appointment um, by, by presidents, um, five Republicans uh, who are conservative uh, in their ideology versus four liberals appointed by Democratic presidents, uh, who are more liberal in their ideology, um, that's something that's actually new and different. Even at the height of the 1930s, when the when uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal was being struck down by the Supreme Court, uh, it wasn't on party lines in terms of the appointment of the justices. Uh, you know, um, th there were justices on the side striking down the New Deal who were Democrats, appointed by Democratic presidents. 
Uh, so, so there's a big shift there in seeing the court as this partisan institution that's effectively doing politics and party politics rather than doing something that we call constitutional law. And I think that's bad for the Supreme Court. I think it's bad for the country. I think it's bad for the rule of law to have a court that has that element to it. So there's a variety of people who propose different kinds of solutions um, aiming at this problem. Uh, some of you have uh, probably heard about expanding the size of the Supreme Court, uh, sometimes called court packing, sometimes called court unpacking. Um, but the idea here is that there should be new justices added to the court. Uh, the number of justices on the court is not fixed in the Constitution. It is changed over our history. It is something that could be changed by statute. Uh, another proposal that people have had is an 18-year term for judges on the Supreme Court. Um, this, I think, is, is designed primarily to solve the problem of how long people serve on the bench rather than a problem of the appointments process or the politicization of the court. So depending on what you care about, uh, you might want a different kind of reform. Uh, and the 18-year term one is more focused on how long do the people serve rather than on the, the political nature of the court. Because in that case, um, every president would choose two, uh, meaning that uh, there would be pretty close ties between the consequences of an election and the nature of the Supreme Court. And so you'd imagine that the 18-year plan might actually lead to more politics in the court process rather than less. Um, but if you care about the age and longevity on, on the court, that might be something you're interested in. Uh, I've proposed uh, a couple of um, ideas with a colleague at Washington University in St. Louis named Dan Epps. Um, the first is uh, a proposal called uh, the Balanced Bench or, or 555 uh, plan, where there would be five justices who have a Republican uh, selection affiliation, five who have a Democratic affiliation, uh, and those 10 would unanimously choose five judges from the Federal Court of Appeals to serve with them for a year. And the idea here is that this comes from the, the kind of structure of how we think about arbitration, where there's often <laughs> one arbitrator chosen by each of the two sides, and then a third arbitrator chosen by both uh, in order to have someone that both sides can agree upon. Um, and so that's the idea of that, of that approach. And the, the goal is to depoliticize and reduce the temperature and importance of court appointments uh, and these particular fights. Um, the other is to appoint every, the other idea is to appoint every federal court of appeals judge to be a justice on the Supreme Court. Uh, and then have the court hear cases in panels of nine um, with a supermajority requirement for uh, making uh, decisions that are um, effectively to strike down statutes um, or to change precedents. And what that would do is, again, really reduce the stakes of Supreme Court appointments because they would be effectively Court of Appeals appointments uh, and judges would not serve on the court for extended period of time, um, only uh, for very, very short periods of time in hearing cases. Um, so there's a variety of structural reforms out there that sort of aim at different kinds of goals. Um, and so depending on how you think about the, what you think the problems are uh, with the courts, you may like one or more of these. But I think part of the question that we have to be thinking about is uh, structural reform of the court itself. Um, and part of that reason is it's good for the Supreme Court to have legitimacy in our society to be able to do things. And I think, uh, from my perspective, a partisan Supreme Court uh, is one that is not effective and not good for the rule of law. And so to save what we like about the court and what we want the court to be in our constitutional system, uh, we actually need to reform the court and uh, somewhat dramatically as well. So the only thing I add without commenting on either of the reforms, <laughs> proposed reforms, but I do just want to lift up this idea of not at all to minimize the importance of the Supreme Court, but that there, that what we're talking about also is, um, you know, the federal judiciary writ large, and that and that those are the courts um, that many folks will have sort of more that a larger swath of folks will have. Um, intersection with and that we need to be thinking about what's happening at that level also and not just sort of the Supremes. I, I want to add something on this. I, I do agree with um, what my panelists are saying and I, I'm very intrigued by these these changes. I didn't hear all, I hadn't heard of all of them. I had heard of the court unpacking solution. Um, but I do, I also think we have to, we have to do this in a very data driven way, 30% of all cases of the Supreme Court decided unanimously, 30%, 29% actually, including one that I did last year was decided 9-0. We won 9-0. Um, 
I, I think that what it, what's going on is that the ones that we care, like you wouldn't care about the case I won last year. <laughs> okay, it was a tax discrimination case, McCulloch versus Maryland, et cetera. All right, what we care about is abortion, same-sex marriage, it's these things on the cutting edge, and this is where we're seeing the politics. And so I think, I, I don't know where I stand on this. I, I have to really think about it. I'm very intrigued, especially by the 555 that um, you came up with. I'm very, very interested in that. But I do think we have to think about how, how, the, judiciary, how the, judiciary, uh, the judiciary has to be legitimate. Remember, Trump did not win his immigration ban. Three times he had to change it. And the court stopped him. The court, there have been many court victories to the Trump administration recently. So again, that's where I'm getting my optimism. Maybe my optimism is misplaced. I hope not. But so I'm going to think more about this. But I, I urge you also to think about it. What, what does the data tell us? And what types of reforms do we need? And I also agree with Ganesh that we have to think about in terms of what goal do we want to, to serve in that. Lena, did you want to get into, or did you want to get in on the, okay, great. So I think we're going to um, open it up for questions, audience questions now. Um, I think there's roving mics, since it's being videotaped. Um, so if you could wait for a mic. I've got a few here. Hi. It's on? Yeah. There Can you say your name and where you're from? John Vale from DC. And uh, just a comment, to do these things, I think one thing that's missing on our side is an institution. I think we need to build an institution, I'd say an analog of the ACLU in mission, size, and resource that's devoted to the control of private power. And that would provide a different framework to discuss these things one constitutional way to think about it is that it could be a dialogue about constitutional duties because any government that's formed by a social contract has duties. That's not a new idea. It's President Marshall wrote about it in Marbury. And that lets us focus also on what the Civil War amendments mean because I think in a lot of ways, the jurisprudence of the last 30 years or so has been about forgetting why we fought the Civil War. Anyone want to comment? I'll just say I completely agree. I, that's, I always tell my students, what's the most coercive source of power? Government, second most, business. And we need to think about both. Why is it when the government does something, it's wrong, it's horrible, but private, but when private um, business does it, we're, we accept it. We should not accept coercion. Okay. Well, uh, yes, I would like to ask Lisa, uh, Antitrust, I was a history major. My name is Steven Spitz, I'm from Virginia. Um, and I learned that antitrust means exactly what it says, antitrust. I would like to know what the committee is in the House doing to break up the big corporations that are have aggregated enormous political power as well as economic power. Yeah, colloquially, when I was in law school, people called antitrust class, pro-trust class. So I think uh, there's agreement <laughs> on that. Um, yeah, so the antitrust subcommittee has been doing um, a bunch of work on various markets. Um, so there have been certain uh, bills that have been passed out of committee uh, focused on drug pricing. Um, there's a major investigation, investigation going on right now looking at um, competition issues in digital markets. And so uh, extensive requests for information have been sent out to several large companies. Um, and I will say, just to step back, that congressional investigations of corporate power used to be very routine uh, into the 70s. And I think it's a muscle that has um, wilted somewhat. And so kind of reasserting um, 
Congress's interest and ability uh, in kind of understanding how different markets are working is really important. I think antitrust is an area that has, um, you know, been relegated as technical and um, kind of only the purview of economists. Um, and it's something that honestly, I think lawmakers have been somewhat intimidated by. And so to kind of have, you know, corporate executives come in and testify um, and empower members of Congress to ask, you know, how is what you're doing affecting businesses in my district, I think that's a dynamic um, that could have really important ramifications in kind of creating the cycle where members of Congress feel like they can, uh, they are equipped to ask businesses these questions. Um, and, you know, insofar as it's generating a lot of headlines, I think that's a really positive cycle as well. But I do think that we're in this moment of um, kind of re education in Congress of kind of remembering what the purpose of the antitrust laws was and the importance of it. Um, it's a process that is not going to happen overnight, but I do think that it's it's really positive that we're seeing much more interest. I, I would just add to that, one of the challenges in, um, in Congress exercising this muscle is that over time there's been an erosion of Congress's expertise um, that in part was deliberate. And when you think of the staffs of Congress, uh, there used to be organizations within uh, Congress, offices within Congress, um, whose job it was to keep up, for example, with technological developments uh, and to provide some additional expertise to members so that members had the ability to engage in these kinds of debates uh, on a more level playing field. When, when you're in Congress now, one of the challenges is you know, Congress covers, if you're, if you're a member uh, in your office, you know, you have a very small staff. They cover an extraordinary number of issues. Um, and, uh, you know, there's relatively um, modest uh, levels of pay compared to what the exit options are for a lot of them uh, as lobbyists. And so what you have is this exodus that often happens to lobbying firms that then provide information to Congress uh, that is, of course, in the interests of the firms that they're lobbying uh, for um, rather than in the, in the public uh, interest more broadly. And so one of the things that um, can help also in this regard is, is helping bolster Congress's ability to do this work, um, particularly through the reestablishment of these um, uh, institutions within Congress that can provide that additional expertise. We have mic runners. Hi, this message. Uh, this is questions for Ganesh on the tax code. Can you see your name and where oh, you're sorry. from? Just yeah, so Alvin Velasquez with uh, CIU. Um, so you were, you know, obviously you were talking about how the tax code and uh, can help reduce inequality. One of the things that's a lot. There's been a lot of discussion about changes in the tax code that affect individuals, but not necessarily corporations and how corporations distribute wages. Right. So, for example. Um, you know, and, and which industries are preferred and which are not. Like some of the energy industries, for example, end up paying very little taxes. But then if you look at the manufacturing sector, a lot of the manufacturing sector play, pays 30, 35 percent in taxes, 40 percent of their income in taxes. And there seems to be a perverse in disincentive of those industries that employ people get taxed. Those that don't employ as many people and create much value do not get taxed. Could you comment on some ideas that uh, tax policy ideas that, or tax laws that can be changed to kind of incentivize real businesses that, hi that hire real people to do real work in the U.S. and help close the wage gap? Yeah, so um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll disclaim at the beginning I'm not a tax professor, but let me um, say a, a little bit about that as somebody who works in regulation just generally. Um, you know, th there are a lot of different ideas in, in the tax space on how to think about some of these problems. So, uh, you know, one question is just how do we think about rates? Uh, and so obviously there was the big um, uh, Trump tax cut and Republican tax cut from a couple years ago uh, that reduced uh, the corporate tax rate. Um, some people have proposed uh, going back and re-raising that rate. Um, so there are proposals to that effect that are out there. Um, again, even in that context, though, there are a lot of companies that don't pay in taxes because of a variety of loopholes and provisions that allow them to not pay in taxes. It's not a uh, it's not an illegal action in many cases. It's actually legal. It's just the way the code is designed. Um, and so there are proposals to eliminate those kinds of um, uh, elements in the tax code to try to, to make that. There, there are also proposals um, that go farther to say, you know, if a corporation is extremely profitable, um, there should be some minimum tax that they should pay. 
uh, as a um, as an, uh, a, a kind of duty or, 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 or obligation to give back to a country that allowed them to be so pop profitable. Uh, and so those kinds of proposals also exist. Um, so I think we can think about those in different ways. I think what you've suggested also is, you know, how do we think about this uh, sector by sector? Um, and there have been proposals also for uh, the different kinds of, um, for, for different tax policies for different uh, corporate sectors. And so um, in the technology context, there are people who've proposed uh, taxes on platforms, taxes on data. Um, there are other kinds of proposals out there for, uh, you know, how do we, what's the tax treatment of offshoring, uh, which is tied to jobs, uh, something that you mentioned. Um, so there, so all of those kinds of proposals are out there, but I think it's a space where there could be a lot more uh, work certainly done in terms of both ideas and uh, political mobilization around those proposals. Hi, is it on? Uh, Galen Burroughs from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. I just had a question about the structural reforms to the court and wanted to know if you could say a little bit more about the 555 plan and the role of the Senate Judiciary Committee um, and whether or not you think there, there are any reforms that could be done to the process with respect to how the Judiciary Committee actually considers the nominations, that would be helpful. Um, so in, in terms of the 555, uh, the balanced bench plan, um, yeah, so, so the idea is, is uh, five um, judges would be, have some kind of uh, Republican-related selection process, and we, in the, pa in the paper uh, that Dan and I have written uh, forthcoming um, next month, I think, in the, in the Yale Law Journal, but it's available online if, if you want to Google, it's called How to Save the Supreme Court. Um, we, we outline a variety of uh, selection mechanisms um, that could be possible ways to do that. Uh, from kind of norm-based ways that deal, require both sides in the Senate agreeing, uh, which is a common way that we address this in, in other appointments, to a kind of panel set of folks who would propose uh, names. So we have a number of different ways you could think about it. But the basic idea is you'd have five Republican-affiliated uh, um, justices in one way or another. Uh, they wouldn't have to be party members of the Republican Party, but their selection process would run through the party sort of approving of them. Five on the Democratic side, uh, mirror image. Um, and then those 10 would just choose any five uh, to serve for one year on the federal bench, uh, on, on the Supreme Court, sorry, but they would choose them from the federal bench. Um, and so you'd serve for a year at a time. What that would mean is that in some ways it would water down the um, how much it matters who the 10 are because every year you're gonna choose five different people uh, to be on the bench with those 10. And so those 10 votes are not gonna be so predictive of where the outcomes are gonna go in a Supreme Court case uh, for 50 years. Because every year there's going to be a different set of five additional uh, people there who, um, whose votes may go this way or that way, uh, depending on the issue and depending on the topic. And so that's the kind of theory behind that plan is that it would allow for, for some of that. Um, in terms of the Judiciary Committee, you know, th there have been proposals um, uh, out there from, from some folks uh, in terms of thinking about blue slips, um, uh, thinking about the filibuster, obviously, which is now uh, gone, and some people have suggested bringing it back. Some people think we should continue to, to, to not have the, the filibuster on those nominations. Um, so there have been some proposals on there, but again, I think that's another place where uh, there's more work that could be done. But I, I'm not sure on the, um, without thinking about it more, that when you think about the structural reform part, if we're, it, part of this gets to where you think the problem is. So if what you think is the problem driving the, the, the issues with the court is that we have a polarized political system in which the court is now seen as a place where politics takes place and where both sides, or at least one side to a great degree and one side to a lesser degree, want to play politics with it, um, that's because we have an asymmetrically polarized system, um, what you have then is a... Uh, is you, that's the root of the problem. And so it's not obvious that a solution that is in the, you know, the process solution that doesn't get at that problem won't, won't address it. And so part of the idea of the 555 plan, for example, um, is to build in the partisanship in the first place um, and then try to mitigate it. Uh, and so that's what it's trying to get at is, is solving that through this um, kind of maybe a surprising design of using partisanship against itself uh, in order to try to reduce the partisan nature of the court. Can, can I ask you a question on that? What happens when a because it's assuming that we have a polit that we have a two party system, and I think one of the problems right now is 
one, well, there's two problems right now. One is, do we really have a two-party system anymore? And if we do, um, you know, it seems that at least one party has been co-opted by a minority, um, a, a, meaning a minority, a political minority that is based on a sort of a, a floor of sand, meaning sort of mythology and, and fake news. And I mean, I know what I mean is Trumpian republicanism. So in some sense, I, I like the idea a lot. I like where it's deriving from. But what I'm, my concern about it, just my sort of gut concern about it, is that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, are very, they, they shift all the time. And right now, the Republican Party has shifted in such a way that it's, it's sort of has broken the mold of, of, of what the party was ever supposed to be about. Um, have you guys, have you thought about any of that in that or? Yep, so um, part of our proposal is that it doesn't turn on the substantive content of what the parties believe. It turns solely just on the fact that in the Senate or otherwise in our system, we have these affiliations, uh, even independence in the Senate, for example, caucus with one side or the other uh, in order to create a majority coalition. And so our proposals tread on those kinds of things rather than any particular party affiliation. So if someone was a member of the Green Party or the Reform Party or uh, whatever new third parties they wanted to be part of, um, that would be fine. The, the, the process would run through the fact that the majority and the minority in the Senate uh, would have to agree to the members. And so um, it doesn't really turn on the, the substantive views of, of any party or any individual. Um, and that, that, that's a, I think, important part of it is that people would be free to have whatever views they have and still be eligible to be members of the court. Um, it's just as a process matter, it runs through the majority and minority. OK, we have about five minutes left. So how many more questions are there? Okay, two, I think we could do two. Okay. Uh, my name is Jagdish Chandra. Okay. Uh, we better get back to the topic of what we are supposed to be talking about, income inequality. I didn't hear very much. In terms of the current political alternative, that is the election, which candidate, are, are there any ideas and plans that are feasible? Yeah, can we, can we get all the, the other two questions um, on the floor too, and then we can have everybody answer them all at once uh, so we can get them all heard. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Barris. I'm a senior policy associate at the Century Foundation. I'm interested in the connection more to um, civil rights and housing and particularly income inequality. There have been talks on um, economic fair housing acts. So I'm interested, is that feasible? Do we see it as more um, racially divisive or could an economic fair housing act um, also eradicator in income inequality. Okay, then one more in the back. Uh, hi, I'm Warren from Maryland. Um, I just had a question. I wanted to ask Ganesh if he would talk more about the pre-distributive <coughs> policies he mentioned versus redistributive. And um, I do think there'll be dramatic changes uh, coming, separate and apart from what you've talked about. And um, I wondered what you thought of proposals like Andrew Yang's, the basic floor, basically, and also a carbon tax, uh, something like that is bound to happen sooner or later. And that's a tremendous opportunity to address income inequality. Um, yes, no. OK, so we've got housing policy, uh, carbon tax, um, recognizing this as a C3 forum, um, nonpartisan analysis of any uh, candidate uh, propo proposals on income inequality. So I'll just, um, folks can uh, decide what you want to try to tackle in the next few minutes. Oh, Lisa, do you want to start with the housing housing question since that? Yeah, I'll start, I'll start on the pre-distribution question. So, you know, I, I think that there's a, a variety of things we can think about pre-distribution. I'll talk about just two that, that have um, popped up on the panel um, just to get the, so you get the framework kind of set up. Uh, so, for example, if we think about both labor and antitrust, I'd put those in ways that we could think of, we could think of both of those areas as pre-distributive. Um, uh, so in the antitrust context, if you imagine having an ecosystem in the marketplace of small, smaller players rather than uh, extremely large concentrated markets, um, it has a bunch of effects uh, in all the ways that Lena talked about earlier uh, in the panel in terms of wages, 
competition, labor, and so on. Similarly, when you have strong labor unions, um, it has a variety of effects internal to how corporations are distributing wealth uh, and setting up their, um, uh, uh, their relationship with their workers, um, but also in terms of the broader uh, political power ecosystem, um, because labor unions are one of the uh, only um, organizations that consistently fights on economic issues on behalf of working people in Washington. Um, and so uh, both of those are places where what we're not talking about specifically is taking tax money from some people and transferring it to other people in terms of cash or goods and services, but actually reshaping power relationships that exist uh, in the ecosystem of the economy writ large or within a corporate entity. And so both of those are versions of, I think, I would call those pre-distributive rather than redistributive. So that, those are two examples. Um, you know, I think there are others that are getting, um, th there are others out there in, the, in those same ways. We can think about regulatory policies, um, uh, direct public provision of goods and services is, is, is one that's more redistributive, potentially dependent, but it depends on how you decide to finance them. Um, so I think there's a variety uh, of places we can draw that, but those are two places that I think are pretty um, uh, cleanly feel like they're more on the redistributive side of the pre-distributive side, uh, side of the ledger. Okay. Um, well, we have one, we have one minute left. So, do you want to talk about housing policy? Because that was yeah. Okay. Because um, I don't. Well, okay. <laughs> so, uh, my understanding from the uh, around the what's the economic housing fair housing act is that it's largely focused on zoning. Um, and so I would say, and we've been talking about this a lot within the fair housing context in terms of um, anticipating a proposed rule around the affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, the duty to affirm affirmatively further fair housing and the anticipation that it's going to largely focus on, on zoning also. I would say um, it, that this issue around exclusionary zoning in, in local cities is is part of the problem and not the entire problem and and that that issue can still be addressed under the fair housing act and but that the other issues are also encompassed under the fair housing act so i'd go back to you know what i was saying earlier about um, sort of fully realizing the the intent and potential of existing laws and that the fair housing act there are provisions within the Fair Housing Act that would allow you to address this issue around exclusionary zoning while also addressing the other issues around making sure that folks are living in places that allow them to have opportunity or access to opportunity and, and other things. And we can talk about that more offline. All right, so I think we're, we're at time and I was told it was a strict cutoff. So I wanna uh, join me in thanking all of the panelists for a really great discussion. All right, thank you.